Well, at one point, didn't you do a rap song about John Gotti while you were kind of going through the whole trial process? Yeah, it's really interesting. So I, I actually found some of those albums in my father's basement and garage when he died. So I'm going to put them online at some point soon and sign them. But there was a there was a time when I'm facing the rest of my life in prison. The FBI's hunting me down. Everywhere I go, they're following me. There's always a car behind me. There's always a camera on me. And I'm going, son of a bitch, I'm going away for life. And when they started offering people the witness protection program, I knew I was dead. They don't give you the witness protection program and agree to pay you a few thousand dollars a month for the rest of your life unless they want to get somebody. So I said, I'm dead. I'm mincemeat. So I got no way out of this. So at some point or another, Mickey Rock, the actor, Mickey Rock flies into Queens or the city and he met with Pete Gotti, John Gotti's brother Pete. And he said, look, I want to do a rap song about how John Gotti was railroaded. And I got these kids out west. They're going to put the song together. They're going to sing it. So now the next day or the same night, I'm with Pete. I hear the story. And I go, son of a bitch, let me do it. They looked at me, are you crazy? You're sticking up trucks. I said, I could do it though. I got no defense. I'm thinking to myself, if I do it, one, I'm helping John, who's my godfather, right? He's my Don. But on top of that, I got no defense when they come for me. What am I going to say? I'll have a defense. I'll say, look, they're just like they railroaded John. I put a song out defending John, and now they're coming after me. This was my strategy in my mind. So they said, look, once you do this, you know, that's a whole different thing. You know, I said, look, I'm done anyway. I'm done. I'm facing the rest of my life in prison. I'm probably going to... and." By the way, as a testament to how much people trusted me, all my friends knew in that life that I was facing life and nobody clipped me. Because if they got the slightest bit of uncertainty about you, you're dead. Nobody's going to let you just, you know, keep meeting with them every day and not put a bullet in the back of your head while you're eating a dish of macaroni. That's just the way it goes. So again, you know, my friends, they were my real friends. Nobody, everybody knew that I was up to the, whatever the punishment was, I was up for it. So anyway, I said, yeah, I want to do the song. Let me do it. So they said, all right, we'll pull it away from Mickey Rock. We'll let you do it. So they let me do it. I went and I contacted Pete Nice from third base. And me, Pete Gotti, and, uh, and me, Pete Gotti, and Pete Nash from third base, who I love, by the way. I love Pete Nice. Pete Nice is a sweetheart. Prime Minister Pete Nice. We went to Peter Lugas. And we sat in Peter Lugas and, in Williamsburg. And I said to Pete and Peter Lugas, I said, listen, Pete. I go, I want to do a rap song. I want you to train me how to sing, teach me how to do it, lay down the track, whatever you got to do. Soup to nuts. He signed on. Pete says, you got it. Anything I could do for you, done. He got Sam Seva. Sam Seva is one of the most famous guys back then who used to lay down tracks. He got Sam Seva to lay down the tracks for us. My friend Fat George DeBello, the late Fat George DeBello, unfortunately, he just passed on a few months ago. Uh, I love him with all my heart. I loved him my whole life. Uh, he was the caretaker of John Gotti's club in Queens, Fat George DeBello. I asked Fat George, I said, George, you're always making up little rap songs. I didn't know how to write back then. I'm a writer now. I'm an international best-selling author with my books in 20 languages, but I didn't know how to write. I wrote myself in prison. Back then, I had no idea. So I said, George, can you do me a favor? Write a song about how John got railroaded. I'm going to have Pete Nice teach me how to sing. I'm going to have Sam Seville lay down the track. And I already booked Chung King Studio in Manhattan. That was the big studio back then. So George wrote the song, gave it to me. I went, sat down with Pete, Sam Seva. We laid down the track. And um, in the end, it was great. It was the John Gotti rap song, Justice Not Found. It went all over like wildfire. The newspapers covered it. And once the newspapers covered it and the news was covering it and I was on the news talking about it, I had my defense. I figured if they come for me, I could say now, hey, I stuck up for John Gotti. That's why I'm facing life in prison now. Maybe I got a defense. So eventually when they did come for me, I hired William Kunstler, the late civil rights attorney, William Kunstler. He, de he defended Malcolm X. He defended Martin Luther King Jr. He rode the buses during, during the, uh, the, the freedom bus rides. Kunstler was an incredible civil rights attorney his whole life. But he worked on John Gotti's appeal. So I went to see him and I said, hey, 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 Bill, somebody sent me actually to see him. I said, hey, Bill, will you do me a favor and represent me? I'm taking the angle where the government came after me because I wrote the song. And he was a civil rights attorney. So my civil rights is allegedly, allegedly violated. So he says, yeah, I'll take the case. Any friend of John's is a friend of mine. He takes the case. Um, and that was my defense. And when I went to trial, though, 
unfortunately, there was, you know, I was a dumb kid in a lot of ways. I didn't understand the law at that time. I go to trial and the judge says, you could bring in the, the album. You could bring in the whole song. You could bring in, bring in how the government persecuted you. You're welcome to, but you got to take the stand to do it. I couldn't take the stand. How could I take the stand? They're going to ask me a million questions I can't answer about a million people I can't talk about. So they kind of checkmated me, the government, and I couldn't bring the song in. So we tried to use it in the media saying I was railroaded because of the song, but I couldn't bring it in trial. So I blew trial. I lost that first case. And then eventually I had the stick ups and the heist and stuff. And I copped out to that. Um, by the way, how I copped out and got out of the life sentence, just so you know, I'm facing life where me and my co-defendants all together, everybody hung tough. Nobody flipped. We're in MDC, Brooklyn. Now and then we got bopped around. We went to MCC, but we were most of, most of the time in MDC, Brooklyn. And at some point, the government, we were facing life, no pleas on the table. We're not offering no pleas, the government said. Eventually, they started offering 20 years. So we said, look, maybe we should take the 20. Take the 20, we'll be out in 18. You, get, you know, you got to do 85% of the time. So let's just do it. So we're thinking about it. And at some point, the government, we, we figured, let's fight a little more, see if we get the plea down. So eventually, the government came and they said, look, if Ferrante, who's the leader of the crew, takes 13, then we'll give the rest of the co-defendants 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, all the way down the line. Everybody gets less time. But we got to get Ferrante for at least 13. So I, I said to my co-defendants, what do you guys want to do? They go, Lou, we want, you know, they're giving us a gift here. We want it. So I said, fine, I'll take the 13. Let's go. Let's sign. So we took the, the, we took the plea. Right after I take the plea, I go away and I reversed one of my cases from prison on a technicality. Crazy story. I met a guy in jail who was a, 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 a absolute genius with the law. My friend Marcos Pappas. Shout out to you, Marcos. I love you, brother. Um, Marcos Pappas was absolute legal, legal genius. He goes, I'm going to teach you the law. We'll do it together. We'll reverse you. I got some technicalities in here we could find. And he went over my case with me. I reversed one of my cases. When I got out, when I got back down, we realized that the guy who had violated, the guy who was in the witness protection program, he had violated the program and was thrown out. So he's no longer an available witness. When they gave us that plea and they offered me the 13 and everybody else less, they had no snitch. They had no case against us. Had we kept fighting, we probably would have eventually got to realizing that, but we didn't know. Now, looking back, it was a blessing in disguise because I needed to do all that time that I was away. I needed to, re, you know, reform myself, to, to think, to rethink my life. So it was a blessing in disguise. God has his ways. You know, God leads us through different things. I, you know, I was brought through the iron furnace. Thank God I'm on the other end. But had I not gone away and had I known the snitch violated the program and was thrown out, I might have kept fighting and never and got out again. But then who knows? I could have got killed. I could have killed somebody. Who knows? You know, I could have been I could have been in there for the rest of my life then, a second time around. But uh, but yeah, that's how it went. Okay, so you took a 13 year plea deal, mm -hmm. and you got sent to Lewisburg, Pennsylvania, maximum security prison. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And while in prison, you actually started to read books. Mm -hmm. You actually started writing, and that's when the ideas for your first few books actually started coming together in prison. That's correct. Yep. So I get I get uh. I take, we, we all get sentenced, me and my co-defendants, and they're going to separate us all because they can't have, we got eight guys and we're all tough. None of us took shit from anybody. Uh, even even the, the biggest rank, highest ranking mobsters in that jail, if they wanted to flex their muscles, they came and asked us to flex for them. I mean, that's how tough we were. We would, we, we, you didn't mess with us. There's eight of us strong. So, you know, not, not too many guys are on a case that are willing to stab do whatever they got to do to straighten people out. And we were, we were all tough guys. So now they want to separate us and send us to all different prisons. So luckily, my co-defendants who had the lesser time than I did, they got most of them got sent to mediums. I got sent to the max. They sent me to Lewisburg Penitentiary. I'll tell you how crazy this was. They call me out and they put me on a bus in the morning. I'm getting designated. I'm leaving MDC Brooklyn. I get on the bus and now I'm a little bit of a guy. I'm, f I'm five foot five, you know? on a good day. And I'm sitting and they black box me. They chain me around my waist. They chain my feet. And at the time I was too vain to ever get glasses when I was on the street. 
but I needed glasses for seeing far. Now I got LASIK surgery, but back then I needed glasses, but I was way too vain to get glasses when I was on the street. When I was in jail, I went to an eye doctor and I got glasses. My friend sent in glasses for me. So now I'm on the bus and I want to see, it's the first time I'm leaving this place in three years. I want to see nature. I want to see the outdoors. I haven't been out of MDC. It's got no windows in there. There's no outdoors in MDC. There's no yard. So it's the first time I'm going to be out in three years. My skin was peeling off my faces from the fluorescent lighting. That's how long I've been indoors. So I got my glasses on, and I want to just take in the bus ride, and I'm going to Lewisburg. So we get on the bus, and on the way up to Lewisburg, we start picking up other inmates from other prisons. And every, everywhere we go, five or six guys get on, and they're getting on the bus, and these, these dudes are big. I'm talking like muscles on top of muscles, Tattoos up to here, sometimes tattoos across the whole face, gold teeth, the teardrops because they killed somebody, they killed a friend, uh, tattoos all over their hands. The baddest looking dudes, you, if you watch the Hollywood movie and you said, cast me, the baddest looking dudes you could find for this bus ride, that's who got on the bus. So now we're all on the bus and they're all going, man, I'm going to Lewisburg, man, I'm going to kill somebody when I get there. Man, I'm going to take out, so I'm going to get a machete as soon as I get there. I'm going to take somebody out. Watch your ass in Lewisburg. Yo, I, yo I'm going to bend somebody over. I'm going to get mine. You're hearing all this stuff, and I'm going, son of a bitch. Where are they putting me? They're putting me in a hellhole. This is Dante's Inferno. You know, I've been reading at the time. I was reading by then. I'm going, I'm going to 11th circle of Dante's Inferno. I can't believe they're sending me to this joint. We get all the way up to Lewisburg, Pennsylvania. Big steel doors open up. The cops with the sunglasses and the shotguns, you know, right out of a movie. Bus pulls in, big steel iron doors close. Cop gets on, he's got a clipboard. He goes, listen up, everybody. He goes, everybody on this bus is going to be here for a week or two in a holdover. And then you're going to be moved to either low or medium security prisons. I got one for the pen. Ferrante. I said, whoa, me? I said, all these guys were bullshitting. They were all bullshitting. They were all trying to impress each other like they're going to Lewisburg. They were going to be in the hole for a week or two and then leaving. I'm the only Max guy on the bus. But they did give me an insight into what Lewisburg was going to be like. But I couldn't believe it. So I said, you know what? Never believe what people say. Never believe your eyes. People could look tough. You don't know what's inside their heart. And I knew people that were 90 pounds soaking wet. They'll cut your head off. You know, and I know people that look like power lifters and they'll run from you if you, you know, if you, if you shout at them. So they, you, ne you never believe people from, but this was a reinforcement of that. 